Genes, as I told you, are the building plans of life. Every animal has 25,000 pairs of genes. And then you should realize only from a very limited number, only from a very limited number, we know what they do and what exactly goes wrong in a mutation. If you have an, a clear phenotypic effect, then maybe you can see, study, find out the relationship between that phenotypic effect and a certain enzyme. Um, one step further, maybe you can find the link between that enzyme and the area in the DNA. Well, um, but that's not where we are now. At this moment, we by now we know the complete sequence of characters and codons of the dog genome. So, at this point in time, we are so far that we have the enormous list of genetic codes that every dog carries with them and every dog transfers to the next generation. The only problem is that we, for most of that, the most part of that genome, we don't have the slightest idea what is coded and how it's, it's, it's translated in those steps I told you from the building plan to the uh, chain of enzymes, the protein, to the, uh, the, the enzyme in the end, and then to the function in the body. So the next step will be to find out what all this information means in the anatomy and the physiology of the canine body. People often think, well, we do know uh, by now the whole genome, so I send some DNA to a, lab, to a lab and they can tell me the properties of my dog, whether it's a good dog, whether it has disease. No, for most of it, we don't know what's going on. That is only for a very limited number, uh, a very limited number of things we can do with, it, do with it at this moment. So one of the things we can do is parentage testing, which means <coughs> if you look at, at a pup, it has half of its genetic information from each parent. So every pair of, gene, of its genes consists of a pater, paternal and a maternal gene. Both parents give half of their information to the pup. Then by comparing the genetic code of the offspring with the genetic code of both parents, we can verify an alleged parentage. So what, um, uh, what you may have is that you want to be sure, can this pup be a child of the parents that the breeder claims it comes from. Well, by comparing, by comparing uh, the genetic information for a number of, of, of genes, the, in the information of the pup with that of both parents, then you can verify and see whether it's possible that it's the, this. <coughs> if we find genetic information in the offspring that can't come from this combination of parents, then we are 100% sure that something has gone wrong, or maybe someone is cheating. So, in, the, in case of a negative result, there is something in the pub that can't come from the parents, then we can be sure. If we don't find what I call impossible genes, impossible combinations, then we have to be more care careful. Our only conclusion can be that we couldn't prove that the alleged parents are incorrect. We didn't find indications that these parents can't be the parents. On the other hand, by looking at a number of uh, by, by looking at a number of genes or, or areas in the DNA, and by increasing that number, we can say that with a certainty, with a probability or a certainty of 99 and more percent. Uh, the alleged parents uh, are 
really the parents of the offspring. Because every individual is unique and has his own genetic makeup, uh, the probability that if you include enough markers in your test, the, the, the probability that uh, there are other parents involved than the ones that you, the breeder told you uh, is becoming zero. It's, it's, it's the uniqueness of every animal that uh, makes that we can come to conclusions of almost 100%. Tests for genetic disorders. People have a feeling that you can, by now, can test almost everything. Be aware that <coughs> before a DNA test is uh, developed, first of all, you should uh, know the relationship between a characteristic of a disorder and a DNA region. You just must know where the uh, defect is programmed, where the blueprint for the gene is, and so also the blueprint for the defect. For most characteristics, we don't know. For most enzymes, we don't know where the ge their genetic code is. We will find more and more in the time to come, but still we are far away from a complete uh, picture where we know where every enzyme is, has his genetic code. Then, so first of all, the, in case where the relationship uh, is known, we can develop a DNA test, but whether or not that DNA test in, is developed depends on a lot of things. One of them is how exciting is it to science or to a lab laboratory to develop such a test. Um, there must be, for instance, a market for it. Uh, if not, nobody will invest in it. Then these DNA, DNA tests can be very helpful for breeders because they discriminate between healthy animals, carriers, and affected animals, or in case of uh, dominance, between the healthy animals, the affected, and the double affected animals. So, if a DNA test is available, <coughs> it can tell me exactly what the genetic ma makeup of an individual is. On the other hand, uh, you should be very careful with it. I have seen breed clubs who got uh, the availability of a DNA test and started selecting out, killing off all the animals that were carriers. And by applying an, an enormous overselection, it did so much damage to the gene pool, they lost so much genetic variability within the gene pool that in the generations that came after that they got new disorders uh, at high levels, they got vitality problems, all the things that you get by the two high levels of inbreeding happened to those breeds. So if <coughs> we apply DNA tests wisely we can eliminate a genetic disorder without damage from the gene pool. If you have a valuable breeding animal and it is a carrier for, I don't know, PRA, cataract or whatever, and there is a DNA test, then it's no problem that it's, it's a carrier because if I have a mating between a carrier and a healthy animal, then half of the offspring will be carrier again. And within that offspring I can apply my DNA test and keep the good properties, the good 25,000 uh, pairs of genes of my breeding animal and eliminate in the offspring the ones with the defective gene. <coughs> so there are possibilities to have an absolutely high quality selection program. If you, on the other hand, say, hey, now we are going to solve the problem in the next generation, we don't have whatever defect anymore, then you can be sure you ruin your gene pool in a dramatic way. Be aware that the availability of DNA tests often leads to over-selection of breeders in their attempt to eliminate the disorder, exclude far too much of the genetic variation. 
we will live in a world where there is a DNA test for every disorder. And we can test for everything, and then we can breed healthy animals. There are, at this moment, maybe 500 di genetic disorders known in the dog. In humans, there are 5,000 known. Uh, humans are not unhealthier than dogs. It's only a matter that we have four and a half thousand more to go in dogs. It's an investment in research. That's why we only <coughs> know about the 500 in dogs. Um, if you would have a DNA test for every disorder, then uh, you should be aware that you would have to test for 500 disorders before you start breeding. You couldn't afford it. You wouldn't want it. The reality is that every living animal is carrier for 50 or 100 genetic disorders. So there is no way that you could afford to test for it. And there is no way that you would exclude all carriers because by definition, every living creature is a carrier. Every dog in your population is a carrier. A carrier of something. There is no way that DNA tests are going to solve our problems. There is a second aspect you should think about if you think about the, 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 the <coughs> happy future with DNA tests. You can develop DNA tests for disorders but how do you uh, compensate? There are no DNA tests for the loss of vitality. So that same classical problem of too high levels of inbreed that reduce your vitality, uh, uh, disorders is just one aspect uh, of your problem. In the end, your main problem is the vitality of the breed. And there is no way you can compensate for that loss of vitality with DNA tests. So DNA tests can be a great help. They are very important. If you have a crisis within your breed where you have 10, 12 percent or 50 percent of a certain disorder, uh, if you start selecting against it in the classical way, then for sure it costs you a lot of the genetic variation of your breed, a lot of your gene pool. And if you would have a DNA test, that would help you very much in solving the problems. So, DNA test can be a very valuable help. These DNA tests should be treated as a repair tool. Be aware of that. It's a repair tool in cases of an emergency within your breed. Now, well, an emergency, that's clear. That is a percentage of a genetic disorder that goes sky high. Then, if the, the, that uh, the extreme highly uh, high percentage of animals with a genetic disorder are just symptoms of a failing population management, and that goes back to inbreeding and overselection. And the real problem is the genetic loss of uh, the, the loss of genetic variation within the population, and therefore the loss of vitality. So everything come back, comes back to the classical breeding problems. If we have too high levels of inbreeding, if we apply overselection, then we damage the gene pool of our breed, which means that you have that consequence I talked about. One being explosions of genetic disorders, really high levels of disorders, and uh, well, in case a DNA test is available, you can repair that aspect without doing further damage. But the reality is, of course, after that has been repaired, there is still that other problem of the vitality of your brain. Well, I thank you for listening to this. And if there are questions, 